Okay, welcome to Introduction to Cognitive Science. Today we're going to be talking about the relationship between minds and bodies. So up to this point, you know, we've developed a model for the mind. We've talked about in, in broad strokes what human minds are and um, where they come from. And now today we're going to be talking about what is the relationship between minds and bodies. So in some sense we've answered the question, what are minds? I mean, we've given a provisional answer that we'll continue to challenge through the term. But we have given a kind of answer to what are minds, and now moving forward, we're going to be asking in the next two weeks, where are minds? Um, where are they located? So um, I want to just review quickly where we stand with the model that we've developed so far. So again, we've given a model of the mind that consists of a kind of, uh, a kind of fundamental bifurcation between system one and system two. We've also claimed that system one is realized by modular subprocesses, which again are shallow algorithmic processes that have a um, dedicated domain that they pay attention to and a domain of answers that they give. They have a, um, a, a kind of um, informational encapsulation such that they only pay attention to what's specified by the algorithm within them and we can't look in to see how they do their processing. And of course they're mandatory and these define why these modules are so fast. And of course that helps explain why they are of evolutionary benefit. Um, uh, again, these are supposed to be computational and quick. Um, and we've also suggested that um, many of our uh, mental processes are concept laden, right? So we've talked about this in terms of uh, beliefs and desires and emotions um, that, uh, that essentially, um, we uh, form beliefs that come in uh, as believed, like when we hear someone else speaking, we come to believe the things that they are saying. And additionally, we've uh, talked about how emotions are constructed from concepts that are culturally specific to us that are in a sense, socially constructed by our cultures. But we still have, haven't really answered the question, what kinds of things have minds? And in effect, two of the things that you've looked at for this week uh, are attempting to try and answer this question. Some of the other works, and this will be covered in the next presentation for this week, are looking at um, just how far do our minds ex extend? Can my mind encompass things that are found in my notebook or on the internet? That's the kind of external mind thesis that we'll be talking about later. But a kind of more basic question is, what kinds of things have minds? Do, uh, does it require a physical body to have a mind, for example, might be one question we would ask uh, related to, to, to today's lecture. Um, another question uh, bears on the podcast that I hope you've listened to um, or will listen to soon uh, from Radiolab about um, whether uh, complex biological uh, systems, such as the system that exists between trees and, uh, and fungi, uh, could constitute a mind of its own. So for example, could the forest have a mind? So uh, again, uh, you should have a, have a listen to that um, podcast and that'll give you a good idea of that. Additionally, this um, discussion for today is going to cover uh, the uh, reading that is by myself and two other authors, um, Eric Mandelbaum and uh, Sean Nichols. Uh, on brain damage, mind damage, and dualism. Um, and so one of the theories that we're going to be looking at is dualism, and that comes into play with our discussion for today. So again, our discussion for today is what does it take to have a mind? Um, right, we haven't said anything in effect about the physical realizers of mental systems, right? Does it, does it require a certain kind of body in order to have a mind? Well, I think one thing is clear, though, that we can say about the relationship between minds and physical realizers, and that is that minds are intimately related with brains. And by brains, I mean here nervous systems, right? So uh, we have a brain that is composed of various neurons, which are themselves nerves, and we might think, we might think this brain extends out into our body, that it involves the uh, nerves that we find in our spinal cord, and then our um, periphery limbs, right, that feel experiences from the environment. This is a specific kind of biological organic setup, and um, it seems that the minds that we know, right, the minds of other humans, of other intelligent animals, are intimately related 
with their having brains. There may be some exceptions to this. If you've seen uh, a show recently um, called uh, My Octopus Teacher, um, it might uh, suggest uh, some uh, challenges to this view because octopuses have these massively distributed nervous systems. They don't really have a brain or a cerebellum in the same way that we do. But in general, our best examples of minded entities, ourselves, our dogs, our cats, horses, other animals, dolphins, um, are animals with brains. And so it seems that minds are intimately related to brains. But the nature of this relationship is an issue. We don't have a good idea of how it is that a brain can give rise to a mind. And so um, the question today relates to this. So the question is what's essentially called in philosophy the mind-body problem. And so the mind-body problem asks, what is the relationship between the mental and the physical? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Essentially, the lecture that I'm giving you today is a uh, very brief reduction of some of the main positions on the mind-body problem. If you're interested in this question, we cover it in more detail in my class, Philosophy of Mind, which is taught on a two-year uh, system. And you can check that class out uh, later in your Lawrence career if you're interested in learning more about this. Um, the mind-body problem is a perennial problem in philosophy. It's been discussed um, at least since Plato. Um, and as one author puts this problem, it, it goes as follows. So I have a mind which contains various beliefs, desires, sensations, and emotions. I also have a brain. This physical thing is a structured piece of tissue containing an intricate web of neurons. Are the mind and the brain one and the same thing? Are my beliefs, desires, emotions, and sensations identical with physical things found in my brain? Or are the mind and the brain different objects? So this is how the, the philosopher Elliot Sober, who works at the University of Wisconsin, poses this question. Um, a series of questions, in effect. Are the mind and the brain one and the same thing? Are my beliefs, desires, emotions, and sensations identical with physical things found in my brain? Or are the mind and the brain different objects? So we're going to explore this question today. Um, I think a first answer to this question is provided by Cartesian dualism. So we've talked a little bit about Descartes before when we talked about the Spinozan view of belief, I'm sorry, the Cartesian view of belief formation from uh, from um, uh, Gilbert, who we talked about uh, last week. Um, but uh, Descartes, this influential philosopher from the 16th century, um, essentially offered the following view. And here's a picture of Descartes. So what he said was, mental substances are a fundamentally different kind of thing than physical substances, right? So some of us may think that minds are physical entities in themselves. But Descartes thought, no, they're this like radically different kind of thing. So we have physical things and we also have mental things, said Descartes. And uh, mental minds, mental systems are uh, radically different kinds of things than our physical bodies. But, but Descartes thought that mental and physical substance interact in a causal way. So his thought was, and this seems intuitive to us, I think, that um, mental states can cause physical states in our bodies. If I want to take a drink of water, um, my mind may uh, lead me to lift the cup and take a drink, right? So my mind causes an, a, a reaction in a physical substance. And uh, Descartes thought um, that uh, bodies can cause mental states, right? So think about a bodily organ like my eyes looking out on the world. I can see things. So, so my eyes cause me to form certain experiences in my mind. So this is the two aspects of the view. Minds and bodies are radically different things, but mental, mental and physical substances can interact in a causal way. So we might ask, why would someone embrace Cartesian dualism? And indeed, um, you know, Descartes wrote, uh, laid out this position in a very compelling way in uh, the 16th or um, the 17th century, 1630s, I believe, when his book is published. Sorry, I've got his life dates wrong again. The book I'm thinking of here is uh, Meditations on First Philosophy, which is Descartes' masterwork. Um, but you know, he developed this position in other papers as well, um, other works as well. But um, uh, you know, this view was laid out you know 400 years ago, and there are still many people who embrace this view. I think it is, in some ways, a very predominant view. Uh, amongst religious people as well. So what are the reasons why we might accept Cartesian dualism? 
Well, I think at, at some point, you know, in the last comment I made alludes to this, I think many of us have at one point in our life or another thought that this may be the correct view of the mind-body relationship. And if we were in a classroom right now, I would ask sort of for a show of hands. Um, but maybe you can just think if you've thought of this before, if you've thought of us as having both a body and a soul, right, as having these two aspects to ourselves. Well, I mean, another kind of question that you can pause and think about right now is, why did you think this view might be correct? And it may be because it's inherited from your religion. So here are some different reasons that we might think this view is correct, right? So we might embrace a religion that says uh, survival of death exists. So after you die and your body rots into the soil, um, perhaps you will live on in some future state. Well, obviously it can't be your body that's living on then. It's, it's been destroyed. So it has to be your mind that's doing this. Um, another reason is that we may think that the mind is different from the body is because of a, a kind of principle called Leibniz's law, um, which uh, tells us, right, that um, if there is a difference between two things and they cannot be the, the same thing, if two things have, or if, if A and B have different properties, then A and B can't be the same thing. And, and I mean, that seems like pretty obvious to us. Um, but there may be reason, this may give us a reason for thinking that our minds are different from our bodies. Like right now, um, I'm experiencing a white square in um, my visual cortex, right? I'm looking at the screen, uh, which I'm reading off of to talk to you about. And um, it, it's, it's a, it embodied in a kind of white square that I visually experience. But of course, so, so that's like happening in my mind. I'm experiencing this white square in my mind. But hopefully there's not a white square that actually physically exists in my visual cortex. That would be a sign of a pretty serious medical condition, right? So um, Leibniz's law uh, tell, uh, in many instances should suggest that the mind and the body are different things. Right now, um, my mind has a white square in it. My body does not have a white square in it. So um, Leibniz's law might suggest that these are different things. And then I think additionally, um, introspection provides some kind of evidence for uh, the duality of mind and body, right? Experience and belief seem so different from neurons or computations. How could neurons and computations give rise to the rich experience that I have of the world? So when we look into our own minds, they just don't seem like the kind of physical stuff we interact with in like a neuroscience lab. Um, other theorists have suggested that, in fact, we are innate dualists. Uh, this view is expressed by the psychologist Paul Bloom, who's argued that, um, in effect, when people are born, they, um, there's a kind of innate tendency to separate mind and body. We'll talk about this a little more later in the term when we talk about religion. But Paul Bloom thinks, in effect, that there are two systems that are operating in the mind. One system for understanding the relationships between physical objects and one system for understanding how, um, how uh, minds behave, right? So I can make predictions about how um, other minded entities are going to behave in different circumstances. That's a key kind of way in which we navigate the world. And the psychologist Paul, Paul Bloom has suggested that we have a kind of innate system for that. We clearly have an innate system for thinking about how objects move through the world physically. And so because we have these two systems, two kind of systems of thinking about the world, Bloom thinks it's just natural that we should fall into thinking of um, bodies, physical bodies, as being different from minds or psychical substances. Um, there is some additional empirical evidence for this view, and that's why that picture of that mouse appears there. Um, these, th this evidence comes from Baring and Bjorklunden, who in 2004 published a series of studies called the Brown Mouse Studies. So um, they asked us to, uh, sorry, I didn't have a slide for that. They asked us to consider a brown, a brown mouse who is uh, walking through the, the swamp. He's tired, he's hungry. Um, he really just wants to get to his home and go to bed. Um, he has to go to the bathroom maybe, but he doesn't do that until he gets home. So they're, they're telling these stories to very young children, um, children who are, um, you know, four or five. Um, and uh, they asked the children uh, to imagine um, uh, that this brown mouse is eaten by an alligator. And so then the question is, okay, the brown mouse has been eaten. And so they asked some various questions. Does uh, the brown mouse um, still want to get home? Children say no. 
Does he still need to go to the bathroom? The children say no to that. But they still do think that there is kind of a residual experience that this brown mouse is having. He's sad. He's um, in pain. They think these stay around even after he's been eaten. Um, and so this suggests that, that we um, continue to attribute some mental states to entities, mental states that are disconnected from bodily states, even after they're dead. And the interesting thing about the study is it was conducted by Baring and Bjorklund on um, children who had grown up in uh, religious homes and also children who had grown up in atheistic homes, and there was no difference between their responses here. So this provides some uh, evidence for the, uh, this idea that in fact, innately, we are inclined to think of people uh, or animals or um, creatures as consisting of both a body and a soul. And so maybe these are reasons why we tend to embrace a dualistic view like that offered by Descartes. But of course, there are powerful objections to this view as well. So um, one objection um, argues that, in effect, these Cartesian minds are explanatorily impotent. Like, so uh, neuroscience is, is um, quickly giving us a kind of explanatory story for how bodily actions occur uh, by looking at the way in which uh, our brains relate to our bodies. And, um, you know, uh, higher levels of activation in certain areas of the brain may, may cause or uh, explain why a person behaves in certain ways. Think about an explanation like that that a neuroscience might off, my, neuroscientist might offer. Um, it doesn't rely upon these kind of innate minds that are doing work. It just points to physical processes. And this seems to be really explaining quite a bit now. So maybe these Cartesian minds just aren't explanatorily useful to us. Um, additionally, uh, Cartesian minds uh, uh, may be causally inert, or at least the idea here is that there's not a good explanation of how uh, Cartesian minds can cause uh, responses to, act in the, uh, or to occur in a body. Um, again, a big component of Descartes' view is that Cartesian minds are non-physical substance, or that minds are non-physical substances, but they causally interact with bodies. But that's just like an incredibly weird thing to explain. How could a non-physical thing push a physical thing around? And in fact, uh, philosophers who have subscribed to this kind of dualistic view have never been able to offer a good position or a good explanation for why that is the case or how that could happen, how a non-physical mind could move physical matter. And then a kind of third reason against or to reject the Cartesian view is provided in the article that you read uh, for today, Mind Damage, Brain Damage, and Dualism. And so that article argues that minds seem destroyable though uh, through brain damage, right? So um, if I, if I, um, if I uh, suffer a stroke, um, as uh, you know, the example of M provides in that article, uh, then I, um, Th that is clearly damaged my brain. And in um, the case of this particular uh, person, right, uh, actually I believe it's CW is the, the person who's damaged. I'll put a video up showing you uh, the particular case. Um, you know, because he suffers a, uh, a bout of hepatitis, which causes a fever, which destroys parts of his brain, he is subsequently unable to recall, um, you know, a short, uh, you know, to have a short-term memory that recalls things that happened uh, in the very recent past. And also he's unable to recall um, events, important events, uh, or he's unable to lay down new memories about things that are happening. So he can remember things about the past, but he cannot uh, remember new things that people say to him in an instance, and he can't form new long-term memories. Um, so uh, according, right, there are different explanations we could give for why this happens if we're a Cartesian, but as the article discusses, none of them seem entirely satisfying. And it seems instead that in fact, uh, destruction to our brains actually does destroy our minds, which undercuts a lot of the evidence or a lot of the reasons that one might accept a Cartesian theory, right? Um, as the article mentions, uh, if um, you know, my mind rotting away destroys um, all of the most important things of my mental life, then what can be the promise of a um, eternal life in heaven? Um, and so uh, that may undercut some of the motivation for the Cartesian view. But 
I invite you to look at that article to learn more about that. So let's uh, go on and look at another theory here. So next theory I want us to talk about, and again, um, I'm gonna cover four theories here from the philosophy of mind uh, and uh, on the mind-body problem. You can learn more about these in my class or um, I can point you to some works if you're more interested in them, but we're kind of looking at them at sort of a breakneck speed right now. So next view I'm gonna introduce you to is behaviorism. And remember, our mind-body question is asking, what is the relationship between the mind and the physical body? We each have a mind and we each have a body. What's the relationship between those two things? So the Cartesian view we just looked at said that they are in fact different substances that causally interact with each other. But the next three views we're going to look at reject this substance dualism. They wanna say no, in some way it is uh, the physical body that realizes a physical mind. They're gonna give different answers for why that's so the next view I want to introduce you to is behaviorism. And behaviorism uh, asks us first to consider how do we confirm that someone is in a particular mental state? So this is sort of the starting point from which behaviorism begins. How do we confirm this? How do you know, for example, that your friend is sad? Or how do you know if um, uh, uh, your uh, professor is angry with you? Or how do you know, uh, for example, if your roommate is, is hungry? Well. What this view says is, if we want to confirm someone's, uh, that someone's in a particular mental state, we look at their behavior, right? So we see what their expression is doing. We look at their, um, at their emotional responses, such as their crying, if they're crying, or um, how they move their body, if they move anxiously, or so on. So for example, if someone is in pain, um, we know that they are wincing in circumstances of damage or disorder. So how do we know if someone's in pain? Well, we see them wincing, for example, holding their back after lifting something heavy. So we look at their behavior. What were they doing? What are they doing now? And we use that evidence to tell us what mental state they are in. Um, or, you know, for example, another kind of way in which we know about people's mental states is through their overt linguistic behavior. What are the things they say? Right? If someone tells you that Belize is a nice place for a vacation, then they presumably believe that thing. Right? So um, these are the kinds of cues that we rely upon to tell if someone is in a particular mental state. And what behaviorism says is, well, rather than treating these behaviors simply as indicators of hidden mental states that we can't see, let's just identify the mental states with the behaviors directly. So um, behaviorism says, uh, you know, we just, we shouldn't be thinking that these behaviors are signs of these kind of occult hidden mental states going on in your head. Instead, what does it mean to say that someone's in pain? Well, what it means is just that they are wincing and they're behaving in a certain way. What does it mean that someone thinks Belize is a nice place to visit? Well, um, what it is for them to think that is for them to be inclined to say it. Um, so the basic idea is that we're not gonna say that these behaviors are a sign of something else. Instead, what we actually mean when we talk about mental states is uh, the behaviors themselves, the relationship between these impingements of the physical world and these behavioral responses. Now, there are two flavors of behaviorism. Um, so uh, initially, this view was put forward uh, in the psychological sciences um, by uh, in the 19 um, teens and 20s by a guy named Watson and then later on uh, by uh, the psychologist B.F. Skinner who you may have heard of and these psychological behaviorists or we can call them methodological behaviorists their actual view um, didn't really it wasn't really a thesis on what mental states are as I've just suggested but instead was a view that said well, look, these internal cognitive states are scientifically disreputable. We can't observe them. And remember, this is before uh, uh, de well-developed or, or really any kind of brain imaging. They, they could tell a little bit about how the brain functioned through lesion studies. So when people are, are uh, damaged in various ways um, and exhibit behaviors that are uh, unusual, um, you can figure out what brain areas are involved in that by just waiting until those humans pass away and then dissecting their brain and seeing what areas were damaged. So that was kind of a primary way in which early knowledge of the relationship between behaviors and brain states was, um, was acquired. But uh, notice, you know, that is a, a very uh, drawn out process. Um, whereas today we can just use fMRI or EEG or these various methods to look at brain function. 
Um, so uh, what these methodological behaviors said, well, is we're trying to be scientists. Scientists have to talk about observable things. Internal cognitive states are not observable. So what we need to do instead is talk about stimuli responses. So we need to talk about the way in which environmental impingements um, relate to behaviors. And so um, be behaviors of this variety uh, um, looked at various ways in which um, uh, training occurred in different environments. Um, so these guys don't really take a thesis on what mental states are, but the second approach really does. So the second approach is the approach of logical behaviorism. And this view may be associated most uh, prominently with a uh, British philosopher, uh, Oxford philosopher named uh, Gilbert Ryle. And so Gilbert Ryle um, puts forward a kind of meaning theory about what we actually mean when we use terms like uh, mental terms like believing or being smart or so on. And his thesis is, well, if we look at these, the, the way people talk about mental states and we analyze what they're actually saying, then um, it becomes clear that mental states, uh, that our mental state terminology is a kind of shorthand for talking about behavioral responses to environmental impingements, right? So, um, you know, uh, when I say Leo is in pain, that doesn't mean that he's in some kind of ghostly or otherwise internal state. Instead, what that means is, it's, you know, saying in pain, that's a kind of shorthand for this behavioral stuff. So um, if you think about it like this, I could have said um, Leo is wincing, groaning, uh, and holding his back because of the large piece of concrete he just tried to lift, right? But instead, what the behavior says is that we invent this mental terminology, uh, such as pain, to stand in for that long sentence uh, about behavioral information. Um, so on this view, yeah, what we actually mean when we talk about mental states is, uh, what we mean is to refer to people's behavior. Now, there are various problems with behaviorism, but I think it should be first noted that as a positive, it doesn't face dualism's problems, right? So, you know, all that's being talked about here are physically respectable entities, impingements on a body, like physical impingements and behavioral outputs. So we don't have any weird stuff to explain the relationship to. We don't have to explain um, how, uh, you know, a, a non-material substance moves a physical substance. Um, and the other problems that arise for dualism as well, things to do with its, its support, um, things to do with, um, uh, you know, how, uh, how, um, the, uh, you, you know, like it's, it's um, not something that is scientifically respectable to refer to. Those problems don't arise for behaviorism. But many problems all its own do arise for behaviorism. And here are two of those problems. So the first is we can imagine uh, uh, beings who are in a mental state, a particular mental state, but aren't showing any uh, evidence for it. And also we can imagine beings who are not in uh, the relevant mental state, but are showing all of the behavior related to it. So imagine someone who is a super actor, like an actor who is so skilled that when they act their part, say their part about someone being sad, they actually realize all of the, the finest detail um, responses to the state of sadness that you can possibly imagine. Like maybe even their uh, skin conductancy changes and their hair stands on end. They're so good actors, right? Well, um, that actor, let's imagine, doesn't have to be in the mental state. He doesn't have to actually be sad or she doesn't have to actually be sad to perform the act in that case. So it looks like here we have all of the behavioral stuff, but none of the, none of the mental stuff. And that uh, seems like it may be a problem for behaviorism, which says the mental stuff just is the behavioral stuff. And we can imagine, too, uh, a different case, a reverse case. So the super Spartan. Maybe the super Spartan warrior is trained um, to uh, rep repress all outward signs of being in pain. Well, we can imagine this super Spartan gets like a spear thrown through him or whatever, and he's in absolute pain, but because he's so uh, Spartanic in his response to this pain, he doesn't show any of the behavior. He just stands there. This seems consistent as well. It seems consistent to imagine someone who is in the mental state, but lacks the behavioral outputs. So what, um, what 
what do these challenges really mean for behaviorism? Well, these are really challenges to uh, the logical behaviorism of Gilbert Ryle. Uh, so uh, Gilbert Ryle, you know, says when we talk about mental states, what we're actually talking about is behaviors. Um, and so if that were the case, if that's what we really meant, then it should be inconsistent to think of someone being in pain, but having none of the behaviors, right? Um, and that should just be like, like even being able to imagine that should be incoherent. It should be like imagining a square circle, right? Because uh, squareness has built into it the idea of non-circularity, right? So it's inconsistent to think of a square circle. Um, and in the same way, if we really meant by pain, this behavioral stuff, then whenever we imagine pain, we should have to imagine the behavioral stuff there. But the super actor and the super Spartan show us that is not the case. Um, so that's one problem for the view. Uh, another problem for the view is what we might refer to as a problem of internal mismatch. So we can imagine a kind of famous uh, thought experiment that you've probably thought of before. Suppose that um, when you taste some food, uh, like blueberries, they taste incredibly different to how I taste blueberries, right? Um, they're just like radically different tastes. Um, that seems uh, imaginable too, uh, which should not be the case if, uh, you know, if our behavioral outputs are the same. Or imagine uh, that when you see uh, a red stoplight, um, the experience you have is akin to the, to the state that I have when I see blueberries. And when I see a red stoplight, it's equivalent to the experience you have when you see blueberries. So we can imagine that our color spectra, our kind of colors, uh, uh, the color concepts, the color experiences we have in the, uh, of the world are perfectly mismatched to one another. That seems coherent to imagine, but of course it probably wouldn't have a behavioral output in that case. You've learned to react to uh, the stoplights as they appear to you. I've learned to react to the stoplights as they appear to me. So um, even though there's this internal mismatch to us, our behaviors look the same. And if our mental states really meant uh, the behavioral stuff, then that shouldn't seem to be the case. Um, another possibility is to imagine someone who is simply lacking qualia. So if behaviorism were correct, uh, then um, it should be like, imagine someone who is a zombie, but behaves exactly like we do. So they're just like an empty headed individual, but externally they're behaviorally indistinguishable from us like you can imagine a perfectly designed robot or another universe where these um, beings uh, populate the world this seems imaginable too that we can imagine uh, these beings who have nothing going on upstairs but behave in all the exact same ways as us and that seems to be a pretty big problem for behaviorism which says mental states are just the behavioral stuff um, it seems to us we can imagine someone lacking the mental state and still having the behavioral stuff. So um, behaviorists have come up with various responses to try and answer these problems. We're not going to take time to look at those here. If you're interested in them, let me know and I can give you some references. So next view uh, that I'm going to talk about, and so this is three of four, is uh, what's called the mind-brain identity theory. So essentially, um, the mind-brain identity theory uh, well, it's not like behaviorism. It doesn't say that mental states are behavioral states, but it does assert a kind of identity between the mental and something physical. And what it says is that mental states are states of brain. So it says your mind and your brain are one and the same thing, right? So um, your mind is your brain. When your brain uh, performs certain activities, that is your mind thinking. And so uh, the view would also say whatever mental properties you have, you know, believing that fire is hot, being in pain, et cetera, that these are physical properties, right? Um, and specifically, they're physical properties of your central nervous system. So to be in pain is to have some physical event occur in your central nervous system. And so why might we think this theory is correct? Well, we can actually get a kind of argument um, well, I mean, so actually this, this theory can overcome uh, dualism's prob problems, clearly. It has no explan explanatory um, or causally impotent entities. That's supposed to be or, not of, right? So um, we know that brain states are uh, relevant in explaining our behaviors. 
Um, we know that uh, uh, brain states are scientifically respectable physical causal entities. There's no mystery of explaining why a non-physical thing is interacting with a physical thing according to identity theory. Um, it also overcomes behaviorism's problems, right? So those people with inverted spectra presumably have some different, some, some brain differences we can point to even if their behaviors are the same, right? So um, presumably we're gonna be able to, or, or, or potentially at least, we can make sense of the kind of commonality of experience or the difference of experience um, by looking at brains, right? Think about the super Sparta. Um, even if he's not showing any outward signs of being in pain when he gets pierced by the spear, um, presumably there's still lots of stuff going on in his brain that we can point to and say, well, that is the mental state. That is the mental state of pain. So this view also can handle some of the problems of identity theory. And there also seems, it seems to be a simple deductively valid argument for identity theory. So there's an argument that uh, actually uh, works for identity theory. And that argument looks like this. Here it is. Um, it's a kind of argument from conceptual ana analysis. So what does that mean? Well, akin to like how Ryle tries to analyze pain concepts into behavioral statements, um, uh, you know, there is something to be said for that. So if we analyze like our concept of pain, there are some important components to it, right? Um, it is the state that's typically brought about by physical damage and that typically causes withdrawing, favoring, complaint, et cetera. Uh, maybe it also causes, um, you know, uh, painful feelings, or maybe it is uh, those painful feelings, right? Um, so we could define pain in this way. It's the unpleasant state that typic is typically brought about by physical damage and that typically causes withdrawing, favoring, complaint, et cetera. Well, um, now we have the capacity to do neuroscience to look at how brains function, and we can look in there and see um, well, there are various physical causes that uh, play this role, right? So um, it's the case that the, the state of nociceptors uh, causing activation in the thalamus and hypothalamus um, is the state that is typically brought about by physical damage and that typically causes withdrawing, favoring, complaint, et cetera, right? So, um, uh, let me run through this just quickly one more time. So the idea is this, like intuitively, pain seems to be the state that's typically brought about by physical damage and that typically causes these various behavioral responses. And now we can look in the brain and see that the, there is a physical state of the brain that is typically brought about by physical damage and that typically causes these various behavioral responses. So if identity is transitivity, if, uh, I mean, sorry, if identity is transitive, that is, if A is identical to B and B is identical to C, then A is identical to C, right? We know that's true. If uh, Mark Phelan is identical to um, the oldest philosophy professor at Lawrence and the oldest philosophy professor at Lawrence is identical to the chair of the philosophy department, then Mark Phelan is identical to the chair of the philosophy department. Um, identity is transitive. And so the fact that, that, um, that pain is the state that's typically brought about by physical damage and that typically ca causes withdrawing, favoring, et cetera, and that uh, nociceptors causing activation in the thalamus and hypothalamus is the state that is typically brought about by physical damage and that typically causes withdrawing, favoring, and complaint, then pain is that neural state of nociceptors causing activation in the thalamus and hypothalamus. So we can run these kind of arguments and actually maybe identify parts of the brain that are identical to specific mental states. But identity theory also faces certain objections. So one objection is the following. If I had a complete description of the neural processes that realizes a pain state, that can never tell me what it's like to feel pain. So pain must not be that neural state. So the idea here is, um, you know, if I look inside of the brain uh, and I look at these kind of neural states that are occurring when someone is in a particular uh, state caused by damage and that has the right behavioral responses, right? I can look at that mental state, I can invent, uh, sorry, that brain state, I can investigate that brain state all I want. 
But looking at that brain state is never going to tell me what it is to feel pain, right? So perhaps uh, the, I mean, so this seems to suggest that feeling pain is something over and above just that neural state. I can know the neural state fully, but I still don't know what pain is. So the neural state seems not to be the pain state in some sense of the term. And you can think about how you might respond to this if you were in identity theory. Another problem with this view is uh, that uh, it seems to lead us to a chauvinistic conclusion, right? So think about um, Data from Star Trek. He's the, the guy with the, the, the cyborg with the kind of like um, visual cyclops type, type thing on his eyes. I should have put a picture in here, but you can look him up if you're not familiar with it. Uh, it doesn't really matter. He's an intelligent cyborg. And presumably, I mean, in some episodes, he shows evidence of feeling pain. But now, look, he's a robot. He doesn't have a neural system. There aren't neural states within him. There's like a motherboard and a bunch of little, uh, you know, circuits built into his head or wherever it is. It may not even be in his head, right? So he lacks uh, a neural state. He lacks brain states, um, but he seems to have pain. We don't want to rule out this kind of case. We don't want to say pain is actually a brain state because that makes it, that rules out the possibility of uh, beings without brains having uh, pain, right? And it seems like uh, it, it, we may someday, maybe we're getting closer to it every day, encounter robots who are capable of emotional states, robots that are capable of having thoughts, but like brains, and there are alien creatures, perhaps, that um, do not have anything that, that really is similar to our neural system. I mean, this is a possibility, but could still have pain in some way. Um, some people, you know, use octopuses as an example of this kind. I don't know if it's pain in particular, but octopuses don't have a cerebellum. They don't have a central nervous system in the same way that we do. Um, it seems like a lot of their cognition is distributed into their various tentacles. Um, but they still seem capable of feeling, of having different mental states. They're very intelligent. Um, if having those mental states is just having certain brain states, then that seems to suggest that the octopuses don't have those uh, mental states, but they show clear evidence of it, right? Um, so a view that says mental states are identical to brain states runs the risk of chauvinism, of ruling out uh, mental states to things that actually have them. This is just that argument in uh, more detail. Okay. So I turn now to uh, the last view we're going to talk about. So that view is functionalism. Uh, so functionalism is in some ways kind of similar to behaviorism because it's going to say that mental states are relationships. They're a kind of uh, relation. But what it's going to say actually is that a mental state is a function, right? Um, so we've talked about functions a little bit with modules and this view is really inspired by a lot of the same people who were working on uh, the philosophy of the mind uh, as it relates to modularity in the late 70s and early 80s. But um, functionalism says that state, psychological states are not identical with physical properties. So you don't have to have a particular kind of neural setup or a particular kind of physical setup of any form um, to have a psychological state. Instead, it's gonna say that um, psychological states are multiply realizable. You don't have to have a central nervous system to have them. Um, it's also gonna say that psychological properties are functional properties, right? So what does that mean? Well, in effect, we can think of this on the model of a mathematical function, right? They are, a they are relationships between some set of inputs and some set of outputs, right? So consider a word processor on a computer, right? This is something that's functionally designed, right? What it is to be a word processor is functionally designed. It's not about having a certain kind of, um, of uh, internal programming structure that doesn't make something a word processor. Uh, it's not that it's run on a computer that makes it a word processor. Maybe it's not even like specific um, uh, traits that it has, but what it is, is it does this particular kind of thing. It helps us process words into documents. 
Um, and, and so this view suggests that there's a kind of similar account of psychological states, or we should give a similar account of psychological states, right? So what it says is um, that to feel, the, the, to feel pain is to, ha to occupy a state that, um, is, uh, that is caused by certain kinds of inputs, physical inputs, and other mental states and serves as a kind of uh, output and gives an output certain kinds of behavioral responses, right? More succinctly, mental states, as Fuse says, are relations between sensory inputs and internal states to behavioral outputs, and I should add there, other internal states, okay? Um, so uh, just one more word about this. When this view was first formulated, the thought was, um, we, we can sort of think of it as relation to a machine state table. So if you think of a Coke machine, right, um, the Coke machine can be described in terms of uh, a kind of um, machine state table. So if the Coke machine sitting there, suppose a Coke costs 50 cents, as it did in the good old days, um, if there are no quarters within it, it's in a certain kind of state. And now if you put a quarter into it, it, it moves into another state. The other state is the state of being ready to receive another quarter and to, and to, to give a Coke, or alternatively, to receive a push of the coin return and give a quarter back, right? Um, so in the same way, the thought is you could offer this very complex machine state table of human beings. And if you did this, then you could map all of the inputs to outputs. And uh, that those those relations, relations from the inputs and the state that the, the machine, the human machine is in in a moment, to other states of the human machine and out, the behavioral outputs of the machine, um, is going, that's going to be mappable if we were able to give this big machine table for a human, and we can point to those specific relationships as the different mental states that human beings are capable of occupying. So there are still some other problems for this view. Um, again, it seems to suffer from worries about absent qualia in the same way behaviorism does, right? Um, we can imagine someone uh, satisfying a certain machine state table, but not having any qualitative experiences whatsoever. Um, and then uh, a kind of big version of this is uh, the nation of China uh, example from this philosopher Ned Block. So he asks us to imagine right, that uh, the nation of China, uh, he picks China because the number of people around that time was, I think, roughly equivalent to the number of neurons in the human brain. Um, so uh, it, it's possible to imagine that everyone in the nation of China has on their cell phone uh, a little response key that can hit a button to send a signal to a satellite. Um, the satellites can spell things out above them. Anyway, we can imagine this huge distributed system that can actually realize the input-output states of, a, of the machine uh, state diagram of a human being. Um, and it doesn't seem to us that, that that thing, even if it were hooked up to a body, even if it were able to control a robot to do certain things, it could be, uh, you know, numerically equivalent or, or you know you could identify every aspect of a human brain you could map that onto this huge collection of people responding to one another with cell phones and that would not make for a mind it seems to us right so just having this kind of uh complex in input output state doesn't seem to give us uh mental states um so uh, I uh, want to um, turn now to a particular example um, that comes through in the podcast that we talked about. And so this is uh, maybe uh, related to uh, the objection from qualia that I was just talking about for uh, functionalism. But um, essentially what I wanted to end with today is talking briefly about uh, the uh, episode from Radio Lab on the Wood Wide Web. So the episode's called From Tree to Shining Tree. And um, I just want to uh, actually just recap very quickly. So the four views of the mind, the relationship between the mind and the body that we've looked at are dualism, which says 
the mind and body are two different substances and yet they causally interact with them. So one is a physical substance and one is a mental substance, but mental substances can interact with physical substance somehow. Um, and the next view we've looked at, so, so dualism is the only view that suggests that uh, the mind is non-physical, the only view that we've covered. The other three views all in some way say that the mind is something physical, but they say different things. So behaviorism says that the mind or that mental states are behavioral states. Uh, their tendencies for us to behave in certain ways when uh, we face certain inputs from our environment. That's what a mental state is. We can describe that relationship between inputs uh, and behavioral outputs purely physically, so this is still a physicalist theory. The identity theory says mental states are brain states, and given that brains are physical things, that is a purely physicalist theory. Uh, functionalism, on the other hand, says uh, that what mental states are are almost like mathematical functions or machine state table functions from complex inputs that include like impingements from the environment and also the mental states that we're in to other mental states and behavioral outputs, right? Um, so uh, the fact if you're um, uh, sad, that is to be in a state caused by insults or by, uh, you know, some sort of challenge, challenging situation. Uh, and it's going to um, lead to behaviors such as crying, such as um, being angry with people around you. And it, you know, acting out in these ways may move you into other mental states, right? Um, so those are the four views that we've looked at. So I want to say a word now about the Wood Wide Web, as discussed in the Radio Lab um, episode. These are really questions that I want us to think about as we move uh, forward. So we'll probably discuss this some next week. Um, but I want you to think about uh, the Wood Wide Web and the Radio Lab piece. So essentially, what's described in this piece is a very complex relationship between uh, underground funguses and mosses and uh, trees. There seems to be a kind of network of, uh, of um, communication between the roots of these trees and fibers that the fungi put off. And they're able to pass information from one another, able to pass nutrients from one another, and their behavior seems to influence or, or to uh, influence the behavior of one another. So if the um, fungus behaves in certain ways, that, inf that uh, leads to responses from the trees and the trees can respond to um, uh, what or can pass on nutrients that the mosses need, the fungi need, and the fungi can do the same for the trees. So what I want you to think about is, and, and this is something that is sort of uh, alluded to at the end of the episode, is whether you think the entity described in this piece, and so the entity I'm talking about is that forest transfer system that I just badly described, but you can get a better description of it from the podcast. Do you think that this entity realizes a mind? Do you think what's being described here is a mind? Uh, it, it seems to have similar complexity. Again, that's what's alluded to in the episode. And, and I want you to, when you think about this question, whatever your answer is, um, think about why you might be inclined to think that this constitution constitutes a mind or why not? Um, and then I want you to think a little bit more detailed. What, do, what does this forest transfer system and minds have in common? And what is it missing that minds have? So those are the questions I want you to think about um, until we get together uh, next week for our uh, individual meetings. I'm going to provide um, one more uh, example. Um, sorry, I'm going to apply, uh, provide one more video. So the next video is going to look at uh, the extended mind hypothesis. And I'm going to say a little bit about distributed cognition in that lecture as well. So um, that should be coming out later today. And um, you should have everything to start the week this week. I look forward to talking to you. All right. Have a nice day, and I will see you later. Bye.